I'm not going to do like Jesus. He went, he went to the temple and he looked and watched everybody as they were given. <laughs> you remember that story? Mm -hmm. And he said that the widow that gave one penny gave more than the rich man that rattled all of his coins in the trumpet. Their offering, their offering towers were like shaped like trumpets, like the mouth of a trumpet where you could drop something in there and it would rattle and go around and then go down into the box. And, you know, also somebody couldn't stick their hand down in it and get anything out of it, you know, because it got slender as it went down. <laughs> and the rich people would come and rattle the, rattle the trumpet, sound the trumpet when they gave. And the widow came and gave her, I guess we would say pity, her penny, her mite. And he says she gave more than anyone. She gave more than anyone. She gave the best that she could. You know, that's all God ever expects from us, isn't it? For us to do our best. Because he sure gave us his best. Can you say amen? All right, we're going to get into the word of God. And thank you for, so much for being here with us today. Our visitors, we're so glad to have each of you here with us, and we just trust that uh, you're blessed today. It's so good to see you. I call a couple of you out by name, but I know you're shy and you don't want me to embarrass you. Well, I'm just glad you're here with us at House of Prayer International today. Mark 11, 23 and 24. Mark 11, 23 and 24. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. Title of our message today is simple. Faith speaks, it has a voice. Faith speaks, it has a voice. Father, in the name of Jesus, speak to us now by your Spirit, through your Word, Lord. Challenge us, God. Challenge us, Lord, that we would be formed into the image and the likeness of the Savior by submitting ourselves to your word, to your spirit today, for the sake of your kingdom, to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen and amen. A couple more passages of scripture before we get started, Matthew 7, 7 through 10. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil in comparison to him, Know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And then John 15 and 7, where Jesus said, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, these three passages of Scripture that we just read from Mark and Matthew and John are amazing and enlightening Scriptures about our privilege of praying to God in faith to ask Him for the desires of our heart. Those Scriptures and many others we find in the Bible about having faith in God call for careful examination because they seem to have contained within them the keys that we as believers in Christ can use to gain access to the power of God which is needed 
in order to change the circumstances of our lives. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be one of those people who serve the God who is more than enough, but is always personally lacking and in need. I don't want to be one of those, and I don't want the people under my leadership to be like that, to lack what they need in order to do everything that God wants them to do. You know my definition of prosperity. It's not money in the bank. It's not houses and lands and possessions. Prosperity, a truly prosperous person is someone who has everything they need in order to do everything that God wants them to do. That's a prosperous person. And I don't want any of you to lack anything that you need in order to do what it is that you feel like God wants you to do. And I don't want our church to lack what we need in order to have an effect on our community and our world the way that we should for the sake of the kingdom of God. We certainly serve the God who is El Shaddai, which is a Hebrew name meaning the all-sufficient one or the God who is more than enough. There's no question there. Repeatedly, the Bible refers to Yahweh in those terms. He is our all-sufficient God, the God who is more than enough. So with that being true, then I can find no earthly reason why his children should not have more than enough. Because when you have more than enough, you're able to give. And being able to give is a tremendous blessing. When you give to others, when you help others, I mean, you get a blessing. It's, it's just something wonderful that happens in you and to you. And, and one of the best ways to help poor and needy people is to not be one of them. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because if you're not one of them, then you have something to give. Amen? I, I know that God is a God who is all-sufficient. El Shaddai, the word actually means the supreme breasty one. In other words, he, he's more than enough. He's got more supply, more than we need. And I know him to be that kind of God. God is a God who's more than enough. The Apostle Paul emphasized this point to the Romans in chapter 10, verse 17, when he wrote his instructions on how to increase your faith. He told them you can get more faith by getting more and more of the word of God in you. He said in Romans 10 and 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want more faith, then you need to listen more to the word of God, the written word, the logos or the scriptures, as well as the spoken word of God to you in times of, of prayer and communion with him, which is rhema, the spoken word of God directly to your spirit. Now, here's the central thought. As we commune with God in the spirit and in the word and in prayer, he puts his plans and his purposes into our heart. And he creates the desire within us for what he desires. And then as we speak out of our heart's desire, what is God's will concerning something, we find that his word is creative. God's word in us, spoken out of us, creates in us and for us what God desires for us. Think about what we just read in John 15 and 7. Jesus said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Now, that's telling us that the one who is in Christ with his word in them will ask what they will, and it shall be done. They ask, they speak, and God does. 
as a Christian, you need to know that the words you speak are very important. I think in the body of Christ, we often underestimate the importance of our words. The words of one who is in covenant with God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are very powerful. God's word in us, spoken out of us, can even be creative. Now, I give you a note of caution here. I didn't say your words, my words, in and of themselves, are creative. I said that God's word in us, spoken out of us, can be creative, and there's a huge difference there. Only God's words are creative. How many of you got that? Only he can create something out of nothing. So it is only when God's words are spoken out of us that we can, by speaking his words, create something new. I hope that you can grasp that. I hope that you can get it. I mean, you can't just walk outside and stare at your empty driveway and say, red Cadillac appear. And then immediately see a red Cadillac in your driveway. But if God says to you, I want you to have a red Cadillac, then you can say, I receive the gift of a red Cadillac right now by faith. And God, since you want me to have it, I count myself as having it now. Now I have a red Cadillac, God, because you said you want me. You say, well, why would God want you to have a red You're missing the whole point. <laughs> My goodness. <laughs> Not red Cadillac, anything. <laughs> I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> I mean, it's not simply your words apart from God that can create something out of nothing. It takes faith that comes by hearing the word of the Lord with the ears of your heart, employed by you speaking that word, which is the word of the Lord, the word of God, that's what can bring anything that God wants for you into existence. Any gift, any sign, any wonder is going to be manifested when the child of God speaks the word and the will of God in faith. That's how faith that comes from hearing the word of God enables us to speak the things that are not presently visible into reality, to call the things which are not seen, okay, as though they are. And that's one of the reasons why the Bible teaches us to guard our words. Our words are too important to just allow them to just flippantly fly forth from our mouth. Jesus warns us against speaking in an irresponsible and unproductive fashion, saying, we will give account of every idle word that we speak. Matthew 12 and 36, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. The Greek word translated as idle means inactive, lazy, and useless. This verse means that people will be held accountable for every careless word that they speak on Judgment Day, which for us is at the Bema, the judgment of rewards. It also implies that words reveal what is in a person's heart and that a person's words will justify or condemn them. That's why we will have to give an account for every idle or nonproductive word that we speak. Listen, child of God, we are in Christ. He is in us, and his word is to dwell richly in us, meaning in abundance, 
We should be full of the word of God. The word of God is to abound in your heart. Jesus spoke to the Pharisees who accused him of performing miracles by the power of Satan in Matthew 12, 34, saying, O oh, generation of vipers. I love when he talked to people that way because that makes me not seem so harsh. <laughs> oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. In other words, he was saying, you are saying terrible evil things about me because your hearts are terrible and evil and full of no good. And what's in a person's heart is what is going to eventually come forth from his or her mouth. You see, you don't just speak your mind. You say, oh, I'm just going to speak my mind. Oh, no, the longer your mouth is open, you're going to be speaking your heart. 1 Peter 2 and 9 says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his glorious light. The word praises there is from the Greek word aratus, which means virtues or excellencies, signifying the wonderful deeds and qualities of perfection that are in Yahweh. That means God wants to reveal his unique and wonderful characteristics and works to the people in the world around us, through us. God wants to be seen in us. He wants the world to see Jesus in me. And he wants the world to see Jesus in you. That's important. This past week I had a, a terrible experience waiting on a... Uh, repair person to come to the house and while I was waiting on that repair person to come to the I took the morning off of work I asked myself if I could have the morning off and, and I said yes <clears throat> so I took the morning off of work and me and my dog sat in my recliner by my front door during this two hour block when the repair person was supposed to show up well, during that two hours, somebody came, UPS, bringing sheen packages. Uh, they weren't for me. <laughs> and during that two hours, a roofing repair guy was making the rounds in their neighborhood looking for people that wanted to buy a new roof. And so he came to the door, the dog's barking like crazy, you know. And uh, that wasn't a repairman. And I sat back down, sat in the chair longer and longer. And it, and it was, you know, the time was going and I was getting a little antsy. And then all of a sudden I got a text. It said, the repair person is outside. Go outside and greet them. And I got all excited. So I picked the dog up in my arm, and I walked out the door because if I opened the door and let him run out, he'd gone all over the neighborhood, and I'd been mad about something else. And, and so, and there was no repair person. And evidently, he had come and pulled up in the driveway and sat there for possibly three or four minutes and didn't come to the door, but just backed out and went ahead and got an early lunch. And so I called the company and I said, what's going on? Well, he was there. Well, he didn't come to the door. Well, he's required to come to the door. So he must have, no, he didn't come to the door. My dog would have told me if he came to the door. He told me about the other two that came to the door. And he would have told me about him if he came to the door. He didn't come to the door. Well, I'll set you another appointment. And I said, well, that's really great since I burned all this time already, but go ahead. They said, now this was Wednesday. They said, okay, he can't come back till Saturday. And I said, okay, I'm coming down there. 
And so I got in my car. And I drove down there. And either I called Teresa or she called me. I think she called me. She said, where are you? I said, I'm going to such and such a place. And I'm going to let them have it. She said something like, well, that's not like you. And I said, I'm really upset. You don't usually get upset. Well, I am today. I'm upset, and I'm going to go in and let them have it. I started to walk in there, and I was mad, you know, a waste of my time. And I walked in, I walked, I, and as I was walking in the door, I felt this check in my, in my spirit. That's not, that's not who you are. That's not how you act. You straighten up. So I walked in the door. And I tried to be the nicest man in Washita Parish. I did. I was so sweet and complimentary and nice and kind and just, oh, just dripping with honey. I really was. I mean, they were, they actually gave me stuff, you know. <laughs> Handed me free stuff, you know. And, and, and uh, and then the head manager got on the computer and did this and 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 said, you know, this was, this was, uh, I can't remember what time it was. This was about 2 o'clock. Yeah, about 2 o'clock. Maybe 3. And the manager did this and this and this and said, well, instead of Saturday, you'll have somebody at your house by 4 o'clock today. And it was after three because I remember I had to I had to try to hurry to get home to make sure they didn't get there and me not be there. <laughs> and when I when I got home, Teresa was there and they were there, and everything got fixed. But here's what I wanted to tell you: before I walked out and said the sweetest goodbye, the manager who was a lady. She said, oh, by the way, I visited your church a little while back. <laughs> I said, oh, that is so great. I'd love for you to come again. I'd love to see you any time that you could come. <laughs> and I walked out the door and said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we his ambassadors and sometimes we forget it we represent Jesus to the world we're ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God and everywhere we go in this world we are representing the kingdom of God oh how we need to be aware of that and oh how we need the Holy Spirit to help us to walk in the Spirit so we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Somebody say amen. Amen. We're his partners and bring about his will into our lives so that the world around us can know what Christ the King is like and what living in his kingdom is like. And a key part of this now in us representing him properly and effectively is this. This is important. That his words become our words. You cannot be an effective witness for him if your words don't reveal him and what living in his kingdom is like. If your words are like the words of the people around you who don't have faith in God, who are not a part of the kingdom of God, then you will be ineffective in trying to influence them to change kingdoms by receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Solomon said in Proverbs 6 and 2, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Listen to him. You are trapped. You are ensnared. You are taken. You are stuck because of the words that you are allowing to flow from your lips. If Jesus says, you will have what you say, then how can you possibly be satisfied while allowing negativity to flow forth from your lips? 
Teresa the other day was watching a preacher, a speaker, and the speaker said, now, I've learned something, basically, I, don't, I, I can't say it exactly, because they said it to her, and then she said it to me. And you know how that goes. <laughs> she said, I, I can't say it exactly, but this. Whenever you say something, make sure it's something that when you're finished saying it, that you can add, and that's just the way I want it. And you'll quit saying things like, I'm always going to be poor, if you add, and that's just the way I want it. I'm never going to get over this illness, and that's just the way I want it. I feel miserable and tired and, and sick and awful, and that's just the way I want it. I'll never find a husband. Well, no wonder. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and that's just the way I want it. I'll never get a job. And that's just the way I want it. If you're going to add, and that's just the way I want it, because Jesus said you'll have whatsoever you say. So you might as well just add that to it. Come on. I think, you know, that that's going to help me in the future. Amen? Just that little thing that she told me. I'm glad she, she watches other preachers besides me. I can learn some things from her. But if you're going to have what you say and negativity is always coming out of your mouth, then how are you ever going to be satisfied The formula for positive change. First, change your heart by receiving the word of God into your spirit through Bible reading and prayer. Then, after your heart is changed, change your speech to line up with your heart that has been transformed by the power of the word of God. And then, watch patiently as your life begins to change for good as out of the good treasure in your heart being manifested by the word and the will of God flowing from your lips you will find your new reality in Christ. It's through faith and patience that you inherit. The Bible couples patience and faith, faith and patience together in many places. Amen? There's sowing and reaping. And there's a time in between. So make sure you don't sow good seed and then rip it up with your negativity. Amen? Sow the good seed and wait patiently on the Lord. And you will reap a harvest if you faint not. Now listen, I, I've got some concerns about the church nowadays. One of them is this. I'm concerned that we've been so afraid of the misuse of the word of faith that we've discarded the word of faith that is to be properly employed by the child of God in order to bring the revelations of the greatness of our king and the goodness found in dwelling in his kingdom forth in our life in a manner that glorifies God and makes his kingdom attractive to those who are stuck in the lack and, and, and poverty of the kingdom of darkness. And we're so afraid that we're going to misuse the word of faith that we toss it to the side and ignore the scriptures concerning having faith in God. 
For whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into sea, but, but shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things that he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And we toss that aside because we don't want to be a name it, claim it person and all, all the, the kind of names that we call people who try and just have faith in God. <laughs> they just want to believe the word, you know. But I'm concerned that we've been so afraid of that, that uh, of misusing that, that we have stopped speaking the word of faith. And believe in God for signs and miracles and wonders. And so it's true that we who are of God's kingdom oftentimes underestimate the power that our words possess because we're in the body of Christ and are filled with the Spirit of God. We act like our words don't make a difference. And so we get stuck, we are ensnared. By the words of our mouth, because we're not speaking in faith, speaking to the mountains in our life. Hebrews 4 and 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. In early days of the church, that was called the great confession. Jesus is up in heaven now declaring before the Father who we are because of what he has done and accomplished for us. He's saying, I did that for them. And we are told to hold fast to saying the same things about ourselves down here that Jesus is saying about us in the Father's throne. Jesus is our intercessor. And there's an unceasing stream of prayer from Jesus to the Father on our behalf. And there is in return an unceasing life source flowing from Jesus to his body. He's the vine and we're the branches. His life is flowing through him into us. And that's why we ask what we will and he does it. It's because we are speaking his thoughts. We are speaking his will. We're speaking his words. If we would just confess what Jesus is saying to the Father about us right now as he is sitting with God in his throne at his right hand making intercession or talking to the Father on our behalf, if we would just say what Jesus is saying about us, it would open Open up a floodgate of blessings coming from heaven, allowing God's blessings to flow to us in such a great way that we would not be able to contain them. It would be, oh goodness, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and then running over the blessings of God coming out of our life, and we would be able to be a blessing to so many other people. I want to be blessed just so I can be a blessing. I want to have so I can give. I mean, if we were that way, we'd just share with people. We'd share our blessings, uh, and, and, I, and, and God would be manifested in us and pleased with us and glorified in us, and it would change us and our world around us. You see, it's our words that are in line with what Jesus is saying that have the power to change our situation. This is seen throughout the New Testament. An example would be the familiar salvation exp explanation found in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Now think about that. For with a heart man believeth unto righteousness and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. What you're doing? You're receiving the word of God. You're believing the word of God and you're speaking the word of God. And because of that, you are saved. You're saved. Confession is made unto salvation. Notice the involvement of our words lining up with God's words in the process of our salvation. Notice the importance of what we say as we are asking God to save us. You can't even get saved without confessing what God 
says about him and about you. You got to confess what God says about him and what he says about you, or, or you can't even be saved. Likewise, you will not be able to fully appropriate all of God's plans, dreams, desires, and intentions for you unless you understand the importance of the words that come out of your mouth as a believer who is in the new covenant with God through faith in Jesus Christ. It can't happen. So first of all, you would do well to understand the power of the words that you speak. Secondly, notice that faith speaks. So learn to let your faith have a voice in your life. Second Corinthians 4 and 3, Paul says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Okay, the apostle is saying you believe and speak. Faith seeks expression and confession is the way that faith expresses itself. Your confession is important. In that same chapter 2 of Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, Paul was experiencing tremendous persecution. He wasn't on a stroll down Easy Street when he wrote that. However, in verse 16, it tells us that Paul did not lose heart because of the power of God's word that was at work within him, he continued. He continued to pour out to others. He continued to minister. He continued to preach, even though he was in a difficult place personally. Even though he may have been facing death, he wouldn't keep quiet. Like Jeremiah, the prophet who prophesied 600 years uh, before Paul, Paul couldn't keep quiet because the word of God that he had received, the word of God that the spirit had spoken into him, it was like a fire that was shut up in his bones. He had read the word so much and he had heard the voice of God so much and he had meditated in it day and night. So whether his circumstances were good or bad, okay or horrible, he could not help but speak forth the word of God that was embedded in to his heart and the core of his very being. It was too much a part of him for him to keep quiet. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 1, he said, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. In the midst of hard times, Paul spoke. Why? Because faith speaks. If you have faith, it's going to speak. It's going to manifest. Faith in one's heart just won't keep quiet. Faith just keeps talking, no matter what the circumstance, because faith demands an expression. Paul was actually quoting, listen, Psalm 116. So he's quoting Psalm 116, which is a part of the group of Psalms, uh, verse, chapters 113 through 118, called the Egyptian Hallel because it was chanted in the temple while the Passover lambs were being slain. It's a psalm of thanksgiving for deliverance from death. In verse 1, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. It's the perfect thank you. In verse 17, it says, I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. In verse 18, it says he will pay his vows or praise God in the presence of all his people. So Psalm 116 is a psalm that praises the Lord for answered prayer and promises lifelong praises because of that. The psalmist can look forward to a long, tranquil life because the Lord God himself is gracious and will satisfy him. And the apostle was saying likewise, I have been continuously in peril, and I have been in great, great trouble. But my heart is full of faith because of my God. 
I will praise him because he will deliver me and I will not keep quiet. I can't keep quiet. I've received mercy and grace, and in response, my ministry to the Lord is going to be to praise him no matter what. The psalmist had not lost faith even in a time of great trouble, and so he can now, in the midst of it all, praise the Lord and edify others. In a word, then, Psalm 116, listen, is a psalm of praise for deliverance from the imminent danger of death. Now, Understanding the Hebrew culture and understanding the Passover meal. Psalm 116 was one of the most likely hymns that Jesus and the disciples sung. As they broke between the segments of the Last Supper. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus is singing what the psalmist wrote about deliverance, even in the face of suffering and death. And he's sitting there eating with the disciples, the Passover meal, and singing, singing about deliverance, Yahweh's deliverance, even in the face of death. The point is, faith expresses itself regardless of your circumstances. If it's there, it will express itself in the worst times as well as in the best times. And you will have a song in the night, in the night season. Because faith just can't keep quiet. And Matthew says, and when they sung a hymn, he left and went to the Mount of Olives. Singing the song of deliverance. Faith just can't keep quiet, whether it's David facing Goliath or Daniel facing a lion's den or the three Hebrew children facing the fiery furnace or Jesus facing crucifixion. Faith can't keep quiet. It keeps expressing the greatness and the goodness of God and the power of God to deliver if he chooses. It minimizes the enemy and magnifies the Lord regardless of what you're going through. The Apostle Paul facing persecution allowed his faith to express itself. Sometimes the people of God full of faith are greatly misunderstood. People think that, well, you're having trouble understanding reality, but the difference in our point of view from the normal way of looking at things is that uh, it's not that we don't understand our circumstances. It's just that we understand our God and his power and his majesty and his might and his ability the difference is we understand the reality of who God is and what God can do. My God can do anything exceeding abundantly above and beyond anything that I can ask or even think according to his power working within me, the power of his word and the power of his spirit. And so we don't see things like others do. Therefore, we shouldn't talk like others do. We see healings and miracles and blessings and finances and success and God's will being done, even when the natural realm would scream out in opposition to what the eyes of faith see. 
So if you want to please God, then you need to understand the power of your words and you need to speak with your voice what God speaks to your heart. The third and final point. Faith, believing, prayer receives with thanksgiving. Sometimes even before the answer is manifested. Praise him anyways. He promised you in his word. So go ahead and praise him. The Holy Spirit spoke to your heart, his plan, his purpose, his will. Receive it by faith and go ahead and praise him. The Lord Jesus connected thanksgiving with faith the night before his crucifixion. His thanksgiving in spite of what he was facing. It identifies the presence of faith in his heart. There's something about thanksgiving that just believes God, believes in God, trusts in God. Thanksgiving is the expression of faith that's being released from your heart. That's why a positive confession is essential if you want to please God. If you want to be a man or woman of faith, then a positive confession is essential. If you ever catch yourself grumbling about what is, you need to stop. Repent, turn it around, and start thanking God for what he's already done. If you'll start thanking God for what he's already done, your speech will change into anticipation for what he's going to do. God is going to do great things for you. He does not quit doing good. He's done good things for you. Look at your neighbor and say, God's done some good things for me. And he's not finished yet. Say that. And he's not finished yet. God has done some good things for you. And he's not finished yet. God's going to do good things for you. God's going to do good things for me. Come on, say it with me. God's going to do good things for me. Say it. God's going to do good things for me. God's not finished blessing me. Oh, no. Oh, he's only just begun. As great as the blessings of the Lord have been so far, he has only just begun. He is not finished. Finished blessing me yet. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to blessings being poured out upon me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. I'm going to be able to bless so many people out of what God blesses me with. I'm excited about it. Faith speaks, it has a voice. Don't put a muzzle on it, don't be afraid of abusing or misusing the word of faith. You won't. If your heart is sincere and right, you won't. Let faith express itself through you, and you can be a greater blessing. You can be a greater ambassador for the king and for his kingdom. Faith speaks. Let it talk through you. Bow your head, please. Faith has a voice. It's in you, child of God. For God has dealt unto every man the measure of faith. Faith is in you. Hallelujah. Let that word of faith dwell richly in you and speak that word of faith. Speak to the mountain. Speak to your circumstances. Speak about the goodness of God. Speak about the greatness of God. Proclaim his name and his mighty works for everyone to hear. God is good. God has blessed me. Give thanks unto the Lord. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. If you're here this morning and you and you need God to do something for you. 